Despite his victory at Chancellorsville, Lee felt that time was not working in the favor of the South. In a letter to Davis, he wrote, Our resources in men are constantly diminishing, and the disproportion in this respect between us and our enemies, if they continue united in their effort to subjugate us, is steadily augmenting. Thus Lee thought the time was auspicious to make a daring troop movement to the north, to bring about a decisive battle. In early June, Lee began to disengage his forces from the lines on the Rappahannock and move northward. He headed up the Shenandoah Valley, overran the Union garrison at Winchester, and moved behind the Blue Ridge Mountains, which he used for a shield for his movements. It was not the Union forces who were in the dark, but rather Lee. Lee had always counted on his cavalry, led by Jeb Stuart, to provide him with intelligence. Stuart, however, was out making a daring but useless raid around Union lines. He was totally cut off from Lee, and thus Lee was cut off from all intelligence. He had no idea that the Union forces had crossed the Potomac in his pursuit. He also had no idea that President Lincoln had relieved Hooker and replaced him with Meade. When the messenger had arrived at Meade's bed in the middle of the night, Meade at first thought he was being arrested. Instead, he was appointed commander of the Army of the Potomac. Meade moved his army north, always keeping himself between Washington and Lee's positions. His orders were to protect Washington and Baltimore. His plans called for laying a defensive line behind Pipe Creek. Lee soon learned about Meade's movements. His forces were scattered throughout Pennsylvania, with Ewell's corps almost at Harrisburg. He sent out orders for all his forces to converge on Cashtown. His plans and those of Meade's were soon changed by a little town called Gettysburg. Word had reached one of Lee's commanders, Henry Heth, that there were shoes in the town of Gettysburg. He requested permission from A.P. Hill to take a division to Gettysburg to obtain the shoes. Ready to stop them were John Buford with two brigades of cavalry. The cavalrymen were equipped with new seven-shot Spencer carbines. The Confederates came down the Chambersburg Pike, led by the Alabama Brigade, led by James Archer. When they reached a rise in the road, they came under fire from Buford's cavalrymen. While Buford's cavalry was a force to be reckoned with, they would not be able to hold against a complete Confederate corps that was headed their way. Fortunately for Buford, as he headed down from his observation post, Buford heard the calm voice of his commander, John Reynolds. He asked, What's the matter, John? The devil's to pay. Reynolds rushed the first elements of his first corps into position opposite the oncoming Confederates. The Confederates headed up to McPherson's Ridge and were met by the concentrated musketry of the Iron Brigade. They were forced to beat a hasty retreat. John Reynolds, however, was killed by a sniper. Before long, the Union lines were further strengthened as additional troops arrived. By the early afternoon, the main body of the Confederate forces had arrived. Lee reluctantly agreed to attack. The attack was successful, despite heavy losses. Union forces were forced to retreat from their lines. The first day of the Battle of Gettysburg was over. 8,000 Confederates and 9,000 Union men were casualties. Fortunately for Meade's forces, the area to the south of Gettysburg was almost a perfect defensive position, a series of hilltops forming a U-shape. As day turned into night, more and more of the Union army arrived, so by the next morning the entire Army of the Potomac was in place. Lee's army was also in place. Longstreet recommended a flanking march around the Union lines, feeling the Union position was too strong. Lee, however, wanted to attack the Union army, not flank. The attack commenced late in the afternoon against the Union's flanks. The attacks took place primarily against Sickles Corps in a peach field and wheat field below Cemetery Ridge. Sickle had moved his forces forward without permission, but it was too late to move them back from their exposed positions. Longstreet's attacks on the peach orchard and the wheat field succeeded in slowly pushing back the Union forces. The cost was very high and ultimately irrelevant, for the Union forces fell back up to the cemetery ridge. The Confederates attempted to turn the Union flank by capturing Little Round Top also failed. Little Round Top was initially unoccupied and Longstreet had expected to occupy it at no cost. 
However, at the last moment, the Union's chief of engineers discovered that this strategic location was unoccupied and had the Fifth Corps send the 20th Maine to defend it. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, who commanded the 20th Maine, went down in history as one of Gettysburg's heroes. He was a professor of rhetoric and modern language at Bodine College, and his outnumbered Maine soldiers held off repeated Confederate attacks. Finally, when he felt his forces could not sustain another attack, he ordered a fixed bayonet charge down the hill. The Confederates were so stunned they surrendered in mass, and Little Round Top remained in Union hands. The Confederates nearly achieved a breakthrough in a gap near the center of the line on Cemetery Ridge. General Winfield Scott Hancock was there, and ordered reinforcements to plug the gap, but needed to slow down the oncoming Alabamans for five minutes. 262 men of the 1st Minnesota were on hand. He asked them to charge the 1,600 Alabamans coming up the hill. They did so, but only 47 returned. They did give Hancock his five minutes, and he plugged the gap. Finally, Ewell's Corps made two attacks on Culp Hill and Cemetery Ridge. Both attacks achieved temporary successes, but were then repulsed. Day two of Gettysburg had ended. Both sides had suffered 9,000 casualties each. Overnight, the Union generals met and voted to stay put and wait for another Confederate assault. Lee ordered Longstreet to attack the Union center with Pickett's division and two of Hill's. Longstreet was reluctant, telling Lee, General Lee, there never was a body of 15,000 men who could make that attack successfully. Lee told him that his men could. The attack was preceded by the largest Confederate artillery attack of the war. For two hours they bombarded the Union positions. They had hoped to silence the Union artillery and inflict serious damage to the line. However, most of their shots went long and the Union's chief of artillery stopped returning the Confederates' shots in a ruse to convince them that they had succeeded. See Finally, at 3 p.m., Longstreet ordered the attack. It was over in an hour. Union artillery opened up with devastating accuracy, and Union soldiers from an entrenched position poured devastating fire down on the Confederate soldiers. No amount of gallantry could compensate for the devastating firepower. Only half of the 15,000 troops who began the attack returned.